Yeah, let's celebrate Rooted and all those folks that have gotten baptized. I don't know if y'all know this, at the Rooted celebration last Sunday, 55 people were baptized, going public with their faith. Let's celebrate that across all of our campuses. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Welcome, welcome to Northway. I don't know if you know this, but uh, last Sunday at the Rooted Celebration, huge deal, 43 people were planned to get baptized and 12 spontaneously that night said, I'm gonna be baptized tonight. Isn't that exciting? Just so excited and so ready to just publicly declare their faith. I don't know if you heard in the video, like Rooted is a great place to hear the voice of God. So I would just say this, if you, if you haven't been in Rooted yet, jump in this fall. It's a phenomenal experience. It will help you know and experience and follow Jesus in ways that you never have known or experienced or followed him before. One of the reasons why I am so pumped up about uh, Sunday night's Rooted Experience is because one of those 12 spontaneous baptism candidates was our 16-year-old son, Gino. Check this out. This is him getting baptized. Huge deal, right? And, and I, don't, I don't say that like just personally because, hey, we are awesome parents. We did it, man. We did it. Because quite, quite the opposite is really true when we're, when we're really honest about it. I say that because the man he's hugging right now, Jeff Seifer, has been, has been walking with Gino. Ryan Otto has been ra- walking with Gino since the sixth grade. He's now a sophomore in high school. Every single Sunday night showing up consistently, encouraging him speaking into his life, encouraging him again, redirecting him, encouraging him again. And I'll tell you what, I am so thankful to those two men and the influence they've had on my son's life. Man, if you're a volunteer here in any way, shape or form, whether you're an elder, whether you're a prayer partner, whether you're serving in kids ministry, whether you're a small group leader, whether you're a student ministry leader, whether you're a greeter, a parking uh, attendant and anywhere that you serve, I want you to know you're making a difference. You are helping so many people know and experience and follow Jesus. And I want to do something. You're probably not going to like me for this, but I'm going to do it anyways. It's on my heart. If you're volunteering here in any capacity at all of our locations, would you just raise your hand up? Just raise it up high. I know you're not doing it for, I was going to have you stand up, but I settled for this, okay? Just raise your hand up. Let's thank them. Thank you. We love you all. Thank you so much. We love you. We appreciate you. That was my first favorite picture from Rooted on Sunday Night. Here is my second favorite picture from Rooted on Sunday Night. (laughs) Pumped. So, so, so pumped to see our son get baptized. Hey, so last Friday, about 10 days ago, I was a part of a a prayer gathering, a leadership gathering in Pittsburgh. About 700 folks gathered at Akershore Stadium. It was put on by the Pittsburgh Leadership Foundation. And it's it's an annual gathering for prayer. And I had the privilege and the honor of setting up the table time together for everybody there to to pray. And so right before I was supposed to go on stage and speak into the microphone for just two or three minutes, uh, the MC of the event um, got up on stage and introduced me. And as I'm standing on the wings waiting to go on stage, this is what I heard him say. So right now, we're about to be led in a time of prayer together at our tables. And and we are going to be led in this moment by Father Dave D'Angelo from Northway Christian Community. Let's welcome to the stage Father Dave D'Angelo. Two times, right? And I had like 10 seconds to get up on stage and I'm like, what do I say? What do I do in this moment? So I got up on the microphone and I said, you know, prayer is a really, really powerful thing and it's so powerful. It just turned me from a pastor into a father right now, right here. (laughs) So when I got off stage, I I chatted with the gentleman and, and it was just like honest, innocent mistake. Right? This gentleman is Catholic, and to him, anyone who gets up on stage, you call them father, right? It's just kind of what he's been conditioned to say and how he's been conditioned to see things. It's just sort of what he always does and what he always says. It's how he's been conditioned. Do you ever think whenever we read the book of Esther, here we are, we're five weeks into this series, and we know how it's going to end. Do you ever think we're conditioned to? We already know. And we're already good. And we're pretty sure. We're confident. If you have your Bibles, uh, let's jump into Esther chapter 5. If you have your devices, turn there. I'm going to read us. We're going to read actually the entire chapter of of the book of Esther, chapter number 5. 
uh, beginning in verse number one. It's going to be on the screens if you don't have a device or a Bible. Here's what the author writes. And we don't know who the author of Esther was. We just know that it's an incredible book of the Bible that tells the story of God without ever saying the word God. On the third day, this is after fasting. This is after saying, if I perish, I perish. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and she stood in the inner court of the king's palace in front of the king's quarters while the king was sitting on his royal throne inside the throne room opposite the entrance to the palace. This is, this is the moment. This is the moment it's been b depicted by Persian art as either you're gonna get the scepter, which is good, or you're gonna get the ax. Ancient Persian art had a soldier standing behind the king with an ax, a very sharp ax. Because if you went into the king unannounced or uninvited, it often meant immediate death. So this is that moment for Esther. She's putting it all on the line. She's surrendering. This is if I perish, I perish. And when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, she won favor in his sight. And he held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther approached and she touched the tip of the scepter. And the king said to her, what is it, Queen Esther? He asked the question. This is her moment. What is your request? It shall be given to you even to the half of my kingdom. And Esther said, if it please the king, let the king and Haman come today to a feast that I've prepared for the king. Then the king said, bring Haman quickly so that we may do as Esther has asked. So the king and Haman came to the feast that Esther had prepared. And as they were drinking wine, we know this king loves his feasts and he especially loves his wine at feasts. The king again said to Esther, what is your wish? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. This is like rubbing the side of a, of a little genie thing. And a genie comes out and says, what do you want? Esther answered, my wish and my request is this. If I've found favor in the sight of the king, and if it please the king to grant my wish and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come to the feast that I will prepare for them. And tomorrow I'll do as the king said. So if, if you're not sure where we've been and what got us to this point, at this point, Esther, Jewish girl, she becomes the queen. She sort of gets lost in the shuffle and Haman rises to power. He's basically second in charge of the, the, the largest empire in all the world. And he has set a plan in motion and it's about to come to pass. The Jews are moment, moments away from experiencing a genocide from 70 plus thousand of them being wiped off the face of that section of the earth. And Haman is loving his moment. Haman is an evil man. He's the villain. He's out to get the Jews. And he especially hates one Jew in particular, Mordecai, who happens to be related to Esther. So here we have Esther putting it all on the line, saying, this is my moment. I'm going to let the king know that I am Jewish, and I'm going to speak on behalf of my people, and I'm going to let God lead me and intervene. And we read in eight verses here in chapter 5 about Esther receiving the scepter, and the king saying, what is it that you want? And did you notice what Esther did? See, as I, as I sat through these eight verses, I kept wondering, why did she ask for another banquet? Why didn't she just say, hey, there's a plan in motion to kill all of my people. You're the only one that can stop it. That's my request. She didn't say that. Two times the king asks her. The genie appeared. What do you want, Esther? And she points to a banquet the next day. Do you ever pause and wonder why? Why didn't she just answer the question then? Why one more day of waiting? Why one more day for her people to sit in anxiety, really starting to believe that God's providence isn't going to show up and we're going to die? Why one more banquet? Scholars do their best to help us understand this question. It's perplexed us for years. Some scholars think, well, that was for us, the readers to allow more suspense to build in the drama of the narrative. Some scholars believe this was a way of honoring Persian culture by allowing more discussion and time to come before a big decision was made. Some scholars believe it was for Esther because she was probably really nervous and she didn't quite yet have enough nerve to make the ask of the king. And some scholars believe it was for the king 
Because oftentimes knowing his temperament and his moodiness, it was better to butter him up as much as possible before you asked something big. As I studied the commentaries, it was, it was often the second banquet was for the readers, it was for the Persian culture, it was for the king, or it was for Esther. But what if it was actually for Haman? What if it wasn't for us? What if it wasn't for the king or the culture or for Esther's fast beating heart? What if it was for Haman, that evil, vile, wretched man who just wanted to destroy the Jews? Like, do you have room in your personal theology to see that maybe this delay was for Haman? To actually think that God in his providence wasn't just for only the Jewish people, but he was also for Haman and for all people. See, we are often conditioned to believe that Esther is the story of Esther and that Esther is the hero, but we cannot see it that way. We've got to remember that the Bible is really the story of God pursuing us and redeeming us. And Esther is an example of how God works and moves. And when we remember that fact, we look at this book with different eyes. We look at it through the lens of the character of God and the character of God over and over and over again in scripture tells us that God is a God of second and third and fourth and many chances for all of us, including Haman. Y'all remember Peter, right? The disciple who betrayed Jesus, who denied him three times? who fell asleep while Jesus was praying. He, he, he sort of was that kind of friend that doesn't show up when you need him most. But later on, he gets restored. This is, this is what Peter says about the character of God. He says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some of us count slowness, but he's patient toward you, not wishing that anyone should perish, but that all should be able to reach repentance to take advantage of that chance. Think about Moses. When Moses received the law of God, the 10 words, the 10 commandments, he came down after having this beautiful encounter with God and he had these tablets and God himself wrote the law and words on those tablets and Moses comes down to a scene that's ugly. The people are worshiping a golden calf and they're doing everything they weren't supposed to be doing. So what does Moses do in anger? He destroys the stone tablets. So not only did the people sin, but Moses reacted in anger and God is very angry and frustrated with the people. But Moses prays and he intercedes and he repents on behalf of the nation. And in another encounter with God, this is what the Lord reveals to Moses about his own character. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord. He's telling us about him, a God who is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness who keeps his steadfast love for thousands and forgives iniquity and transgression and sins, a God of chances, multiple, ch because he loves us. But at the same time, who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children on the third and fourth generation. <coughs> Peter tells us about God's nature. Moses experiences God telling us about his nature. And Micah the prophet, when he's out to warn the nation of Israel, these are just a few of many examples in the scripture, the nation of Israel, they're rebelling. And Micah is telling them about God's justice that is coming. He ends his book of the Bible with some hope to remind us ultimately of who God is. And here's what he writes. Who is a God like you, God? You pardon iniquity. And you pass over transgressions for the remnant of your inheritance. God does not retain his anger forever because this is who he is. He delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. God, you will cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea. God in his heart and character wants all to come to redemption. See, here's what we've got to understand. Many times we are conditioned whenever we experience injustice to only demand the justice side of God for the people who have hurt us. But when I read this book of the Bible, and when I look at Peter and Moses, when you look at Paul, when you look at David, when you look at what Micah is saying and on and on and on again, we have to understand that while God, yes, is a God of justice, at the same time, 
He's also a God of mercy. Two things at the same time are both true about God. And to us, it feels like a weight. It feels like an injustice. But what if what God is doing in that moment is a second chance for someone else? So here's the question we've got to ask to break free from the things we're often conditioned to do whenever we experience an injustice. Are we open and willing to live our life with the possibility in mind that God is out for chances to redeem everyone, anyone who will turn to him? Are we open to reading the book of Esther that way? Better yet, are we open to looking at the people in our lives and in our world that way? That God is a God of justice and of mercy. And what God tells us in the scriptures is to imitate him. Be imitators of God. To wrestle with this tension. To sit in this tension. To not be so conditioned to only lead on the justice side or only lead on the mercy side when we ourselves are the villain or the ones who are in the wrong. But to remember God is a God of justice and of mercy and he calls us to imitate him in our lives. See, we've got to remember God is the hero of the story. He's the author. He's the, the, the alpha and the omega and history is really his story and he's asking us to step into it in partnership with him as ministers of reconciliation. Imitate God. Don't follow the pattern of this world. Remember justice and mercy. He calls us to live at peace with everyone so long as it depends on us, if possible. So here's what I'm hearing as I read the book of Esther. When I look at chapter five, when I think about, you know, Esther setting up in this moment and delaying one more day and the waiting that the nation of Israel there in Persia had to experience and the waiting and probably the sleepless night Esther had to endure. I have to remember that it was probably for Haman because I know the character of God. And it challenges me to, to look at my life and look at the people that have hurt me. And it challenges me to open the door for the future possibility of reconciliation. To remember justice and mercy. To at least have my heart postured to be open to it. See, here's the cool thing about that. Probably right now we're thinking, but you don't know what I've experienced. You don't know how bad it was. You don't know how much it cost me emotionally, financially. You don't know how much it set me back. You don't, you don't know. You're right, I don't know. But here's what I do know. It is God's spirit living through us that empowers us to move towards reconciliation. It is never by our might. It's never by our own power or our own will. It's always by his spirit that we can live according to his word. Esther is calling us to trust him to, if I perish, I perish. I'm going to trust you, God, because you're both for justice and mercy at the same time. And I want to imitate you, not the world. The second half of Esther chapter five, it's all about Haman. And if you know Haman, I think Haman likes it when it's all about Haman. Haman has the thing where he really likes himself. <laughs> he loves mirrors because he probably catches another glimpse of himself and is reminded of just how amazing and awesome Haman actually is. After this moment of delaying and asking for one more day and a, a second banquet, the author of Esther turns to Haman and here's what he tells us about this man. After that moment, Haman went out that day. He was joyful and glad of heart. He's having good fortune in his life. But when Haman saw Mordecai, remember he hates Mordecai, the Jew in the king's gate, and that Mordecai didn't get up and he didn't tremble before him, he was filled with wrath against Mordecai. He's burning with hatred and distaste for this man. Nevertheless, he restrained himself and he went home and he sent and brought his friends and his wife Zeresh and he's gonna have a party about himself and for himself because that's what Haman loves. He loves himself. Haman recounted to them the splendor of his riches. I'm so frustrated with Mordecai. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna talk about me. 
He recounts the number of his sons and all the promotions with which the king had honored him and how he advanced himself above all the officials and the servants of the king. He's a real me monster there. Then Haman said, even Queen Esther, you all don't know this, but, but check out what just happened right now. Even Queen Esther, let no one but me come with the king to a feast she prepared. And tomorrow I get another feast with her and the king. I am awesome. Yet all this is worth nothing to me. None of it matters as long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. I hate that guy. He's ruining it for me. Then his wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, and this was a moment where they could have said anything to him, but notice what they did. They chose to feed what was already full grown in Haman's life. Why don't you build a gallows, which is a giant spike, 50 cubits high, 75 feet high in our terms. Let that be made. And in the morning, why don't you do this? Go tell the king to have Mordecai, the man you hate, hanged and stuck upon that gallows so everyone can see. Then go joyfully with the king to the feast. And this idea, oh, it pleased Haman. And he had the giant spike or gallows made. Y'all see it in Haman, don't you? This dude is full of pride. Did you notice that Haman doesn't see it, but we do? Like we get a real life glimpse of what pride looks like. And this is an extreme version, but make no mistake, let us not let ourselves off of the hook. This is exactly what we are pulled into when pride is fully grown and mature in our lives from our hearts. Notice what Haman was like. He went home and he bragged about himself because pride convinces us that joy and security and contentment, the things we all want, the things we all aim for with our lives, the things we pray for for our kids. Pride tells us that joy and contentment and security, well, you find them in what you have and possess. You find them in what you accomplish. You find them in your status. And if you're not feeling them, make sure you declare or post them so everybody can see them. Pride also helps us live in a certain way that, that believes that the spotlight, that the focus of everyone our spouses, our kids, our coworkers, all of our relationships, even of and from our God. Pride teaches us to believe that the spotlight is reserved and deserved by me and me alone. You owe it to me. I'm entitled to your focus and your attention. That's what pride does when it was like you see it in Haman. The question is, is do we see it in us? Because Haman was blind to it. He had another chance, but what good is another chance or a fourth chance or a fifth chance if we don't take advantage of it? If we don't break free from what we are conditioned to just live like by our world and repent and humble ourselves from our pride. Notice the relationship between Haman and Mordecai. What pride does is this subtle way of focusing on everything they're doing wrong and we maximize that. And we say, that's the cause of all the pain in my life. That's what's ruining my life. That's what's frustrating my life. And it minimizes the missteps that we ourselves are taking. Pride is such a tricky thing. It blinds us to the ruination and the very gallows we are building that will ultimately be the destruction of ourselves. C.S. Lewis said that pride ultimately is, is, is a state of being. It's a spirit that's the anti-God kind of spirit. It's the essential vice beneath all of the vices in our lives. It's the utmost evil. When you think about sin and when it first started, I know we think about Adam and Eve, but go back further than that. Isaiah 14 tells us about Satan, Lucifer, what led him to fall from heaven? Pride. He wanted to ascend and be just like God, to have all of that glory for himself. And pride always comes before a fall, all the way back then and even true today. Now, G.K. Chesterton, famous thought leader and, and pastor, said it this way, if I could only give one sermon for the rest of my life, it would be a sermon about pride. You want to know why? Because God detests pride. He doesn't have a stomach for pride. 
And he wants what's best for us. And while we are conditioned to believe and tempted to believe, pride is what's best for me. More possessions, more status, more focus on me, more minimizing of my mistakes and maximizing of their errors and their sins. God knows what's best for us and he detests pride. It's true to us over and over all throughout scripture. James says it this way, but God gives us more grace. I'm reading so much scripture today to help us break free from the things we're conditioned to believe. We've got to hear it from God's word. That's why scripture says God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. Philippians 2 says this, do nothing Nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value other people above yourself. Proverbs 11 says it this way. When pride comes, not if pride comes, when it comes. Because it comes for all of us. When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with humility comes wisdom. The Lord detests all of the proud of heart. And be sure of this, they will not go unpunished. Do you see the pattern in Scripture? God isn't out just to help us identify our pride. God is out to help us kill our pride. That's how opposed to pride God is. He wants it rooted out of our hearts and removed so we can live humbly before our God just the way his son Jesus did. But we are conditioned to think pride's not that big of a deal. I deserve a little spotlight. I deserve a little more status. I deserve a little more possessions. And slowly it builds. And eventually we're on a path to becoming just like Haman. I was reading an interview with a counselor who spends a lot of time in just difficult situations. And in the interview asked him, what what is the thing you see the most in your counseling situation? Is it depression? Is it anxiety? Is it marital conflict? Is it relational strife? And, And the counselor said, yes, I see all of that stuff. But really the number one thing I see over and over and over again in my room as I'm talking with people, it's pride. Pride is what I see over and over and over again. And then he went on to say this, pride is a prison. And it's a prison we don't know that we're in and it perpetuates anger and hurt and foolishness while keeping at bay the restorative effects of conviction and humility and reconciliation. Pride is the thing that blinds us. Pride is the thing behind the frustrating thing we're experiencing in our life. He went on to tell the interview situation that um, often the people sitting with him will list out all the offenses they've experienced. And they will list out all the things that their husband needs to do differently or their wife needs to change or their kids are, are messing up in or whatever. Offenses and other people and how they need to change. And he said, it's so important to tenderly listen to people in that moment. Because the offenses and hurt, they're real. And oftentimes the change that the person is talking about, they're they're often right and it's good. But something happens when I turn the conversation to them. He said this, during the course of our work together, when I change the perspective and I start to ask them leading questions like, well, what have you done to your spouse or kid or your world? Or of what might you need to repent Or how can you display Christ to them in the same way that you long for them to display Christ to you? And he said this, I usually don't get answers to those questions. But instead I get hurt and confused stares. And often I get downright indignation. What I get is pride. See, the older I get, the more I am convinced that there are ultimately just two kind of people in this world. Those who admit that they're battling against pride and everyone else who is just in denial. Esther chapter five is calling Haman to wake up. It's calling us to do the same. To really take seriously this battle for pride because it comes after all of us. 
The counselor said the way he leads his people to work through this is to focus on three simple questions. Always take a look in your life at whose sin you're focused on. Like when you think about mistakes and mess ups and shortcomings and sin, who are you most focused on? Pride tells us to focus on the sin of everyone else. The Bible tells us that the consequences of sin leads to your own, my own death. The Bible tells us to focus on our own sin, the own beam in our eye. Whose sin are you focused on? The second question the counselor said that we've got to ask as we work to identify if we're battling pride, just like Haman was battling pride, is honestly, where do I believe that joy and security and contentment come from? What am I pursuing? And he often said one of the best ways to figure this out is look at your wallet. Look at the trail of your money. Look at your schedule and look at what you post on social media. Because those three things will reveal to us where we believe joy and security and contentment are to be found. Pride tells us, as I said, and we saw in Haman, that it's found in status and possessions. But the Bible tells us those things are only found in Christ alone. And he died to give them to us. Finally, when it comes to identifying and battling against pride in our life, he asked this question of his people in counseling. Who is the focus of your service? Who are you serving in this life? Pride tells us that, well, I'm supposed to be served, so no one. But the Bible tells us to lay our lives down just like Jesus did for everyone else, to serve other people. Pride teaches us that serving, it's kind of beneath me. And, and the Bible tells us that serving, that's, that's our calling. Grab a towel, wrap it around your waist, and start washing some feet. Because God opposes the proud and he exalts the humble. And pride always comes before a fall. The thing about Haman is he didn't see the pride in his life. And the people around him in their moment where they could have said something, they said the opposite. They said, here's how you can feed that pride even more. Proverbs 21 says this, haughty eyes and a proud heart. The thing Haman was battling and the thing every single one of us is tempted to move toward with our lives, haughty eyes and a proud heart, the unplowed field of the wicked produce sin. Pride produces sin and sin produces death. And it's from having a heart or an unplowed field. Now, believe it or not, um, I'm not a farmer. I shop at J. Crew in the Gap. I don't spend a lot of time in the fields, but I understand what plowing is like. I know farmers plow their field consistently. They don't plow it every five years. They plow it over and over and over over again. And I know that farmers, not only do they plow consistently, I know that their goal when plowing is to turn over the soil to freshen it up. Because you don't want it to be stale. You want it to be fresh and you want it to be loose and you want it to have oxygen and you want it to be be new for, for every single day and what you want to produce. They plow their field consistently. They turn it over so it's fresh and vibrant. And finally, they look for anything that's toxic in the field and pull it out. That's how we battle pride. We plow the field of our hearts over and over and over again. We do the opposite of what Haman did. We take advantage of the chances we still have while we are still breathing breath through our lungs. We ask God over and over and over again, will you help me plow the field of my heart to remove any pride that's in there because I know you detest it. Psalm 138 says this, though the Lord is exalted, God is up high, he's in glory He looks kindly because it's his heart on the lowly. Though God is lofty, he sees the lowly or the humble in heart, the farmers plowing the field of their heart, he sees us from afar. That's Esther. If I perish, I perish. That's Jesus in the garden. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will. It's the call for every single one of us as followers of Jesus who are living our lives to know him, 
to experience him and to follow him. It's a call to leave the door open to reconciliation because God is a God of justice and of mercy. And it's a call to vigilantly be on guard against all forms of pride because all it does is produce sin and all sin does is produce death. Would you pray with me? God, I ask that this week you will reveal to us um, if there's any doors that have been closed off to reconciliation in our lives and lead us through your kindness to repentance. And God, as, as we take bold steps to really see what's really going on in our hearts, to get honest, to be different than Haman, God, I ask that you will speak to us and show us so we can humble ourselves before you and live like the way you've called us to live. God, we need your help because we want to imitate you just like Jesus did. And we ultimately, like Esther experienced and like Jesus experienced, we don't want sacrifice to be beneath us. We don't want surrender to be beneath us. We want it to be all that we are about because we know your breakthrough is on the other side of that. So God, help us in these areas. I pray this in Jesus' strong and mighty and beautiful name. And everybody said, amen.